kind of set. Okay. Go. Um, so when the band actually got back together, as, as, as were, you know, you, you finally got past the, we're going to re-release Wise Bones, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You did that first gig in, in, in Newcastle. Yeah. Where, where, where was the gig in Newcastle? Well, it was in a big, um, I think it was a Metro Arena, which is a huge was venue. Massive. Yeah, very big. And the original plan, I think, was to play with Skid Row, Y&T, and a couple of other big American bands. But at the time, um, which wasn't very fortunate for us, there was a big downer on rock music up there, and there was they didn't have enough tickets to play the Metro <laughs> for the sign of things to come. So we played in a smaller venue, about three or 400 people. Now, bear in mind, we hadn't played live for about 12 years. So um, we didn't know what to expect at all. And it was really quite emotional, actually, getting on stage, feeling very self-conscious, you know, big old, <laughs> big old blokes, 42 years old. Because you were fat then, as well. Yeah. yeah. We all had a good few extra pounds on us. And uh, the thing is, was the lack of cynicism in the audience. They, they just looked, they recognised the songs and started going mental. So, you know, first step seemed to go OK. Um, and as the gig went on, I think we all felt more comfortable, started enjoying it more. And like I said to the rest of the guys after the gig, um, why would you not want to do that? Why would you not be in front of all those people sending you all those good vibes? Mm. All that love. But um, it's good because the only person in the band who wasn't in the original sort of incarnation was the drummer, Chris. Um, but he had a good time and he was a lovely fellow, so we all got on with him. But as far as Jay and Kim were concerned, for me, it was kind of like unbelievable that all that time had gone by, that all those years had gone by. It didn't seem like that at all. It really didn't. Did you... In a way, though, did, was it kind of bittersweet? Did you think, why didn't we do this sooner? I, uh, I don't think any of us thought, why didn't we do this sooner? Mm. Um, because there was, it was quite a long process, even getting to the stage where we even thought of having any photos done, or even as what we were going to do was just release the, the album that hadn't come out, the American version of Rasbo. Yeah. Um, and I think it was just a case of somebody said, do you want to do this gig? And at that point, it was like everyone said, yes, let's do it. So. Just, you know, the, th every, the synchronicity was there at that point. It hadn't been before. Were you surprised, like say, you said about the audience and the love and stuff, and obviously mm. we'll, we'll come to this gig at the point that, that obviously yeah. the, the gig you did, sure. But were you surprised that there was, like you said, there was a down on music and metal and stuff? Were yeah. you surprised that there was still an audience for Tiger Tales? Yeah, because essentially, I think, when Tiger Tales finished in about 92, the reason was because of bands like Nirvana, specifically Nirvana, and like even Spinal Tap made a bit of big impact because I think, number one, what they did was show you how lazy our genre of music had become, yeah. that kind of big um, yeah. cor commercial choruses, um, a very big image and stuff. All of that, even though it was still fun, still essentially no worse in itself than it had been in the good days, mm. it's got a bit samey. A lot of bands were sort of coasting. Um, and it was just time to move on. Yeah. So towards the end of the, sort of the glam era, I think um, people were just getting sick of it. And Guns N' Roses were coming out, of course, and doing, keeping all the good much, bits. Much tougher. Ditching all the shit, mm. you know. Let's, yeah. let's stop going on about how many girls we pull and how many drugs and, and yeah. you know, how many bottles of Jack Daniels we can drink. And let's start moving on a little bit, um, which was a bit, bit more interesting for the audience than hearing the same old stories, you know, and yeah. the same old riffs and stuff. Um, so we kind of, our last impression of the audience was that they were getting a bit tired of that, the, the sort of stuff that we were, we yeah. were doing earlier on. But now it seems as if people have come round to, we've had enough of the miserable stuff. Remember the good days when we used to be able to just have a good time and we didn't have to justify it? Yeah. And I think that's always been the attraction of Tiger Tales was that there really is no content there. It's just a celebrating, having fun, sending out good vibes and hopefully demonstrating that we're people that get our, as four individual guys that yeah. we get on. We've always tried to write commercial tunes, tunes that you don't have to be really into metal to be into or to be into our particular mm. genre of music. We've always tried to write commercial stuff. Um, it's been a lot of pop songs as well, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I kind of think maybe we could have earlier on in our career maybe re realised and worked out what our niche was a bit better because mm. I think sometimes we'd be doing really heavy riff-based stuff, kind of almost bordering on the Megadeth territory. Yeah, yeah. And then at other times there'd be stuff that sounded like American bands do this a lot. They do the one desperate attempt at a hit single that mm. would be on an album. I don't know yeah. many names, but lots of bands would do that. They'd have this really all out, usually co-written by Dion Warren or Desmond Charles or somebody. They'd have this one balls out attempt to have a hit single. And I think um, even really quite heavy bands used to do that. And I think we should probably, probably realize that that was an element that we could have um, worked harder on, Exploited. making the band more of a melodic proposition. Because mm. it would have gone with the image and everything. Mm. Same applies to the image. I, th I don't think we ever really sat down and thought enough about what the image was all about. But, but, I, but I think there was definitely a point, though, I think that your image, and it was, especially you and, and Jay, who we'll, we'll see later, and you mm. would not believe, but um, there was definitely a point where you two were very much the face of 
of like you know yeah. what music. I mean, you were the advert in Kerrang for merchandise yeah. and stuff, you know. And I was having a conversation about last night. So I mean, th 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 that must have helped initially. Do you know what I mean? Image definitely. With any yeah. band, what you want to do is get noticed. Of course, yeah. that's the first thing because there's so many bands around. Mm. But it's a double-edged sword. The thing that gets you noticed very often is the thing that kills you or, or stops your career stone dead after one or two albums. Yeah. A good example is Ziggs Sputnik, a band that um, you know had such a strong interest in image and the con conceptual side of what they were doing. That it, people's ears pricked up. It was something new. It was interesting. But um, perhaps the music alienated a lot of people because it was so far out there. It's only now, all these years later, you can listen to the Sputnik things and kind of try to, mm. to actually examine what it was all about. Mm. I still think maybe the music was a bit be behind the image. In terms of them wanting to have a successful career, maybe it was too out there yeah. for their image to then lead to people being interested and then going to buy the records, which didn't happen. So it's a double-edged sword. If you've got a strong image, people will use it against you after a while. And we were certainly dismissed as just being, you know, glam rock idiots, you know, stupid morons with big hair playing sort of party metal type thing. Mm. And um, I, essentially that kind of, it was what we were. But as people, I don't think we saw it like that at all. No, no, I, th I, think, I think a lot of, um, a lot of glam bands at the time, like you say, yeah. The thing is, of course, it's very hard to take somebody, you know, serious who's got a lip gloss on, do you know what I mean? That's, that's the way it goes. So talk, actually, talking about that, you talk about the Newcastle gig. So you're backstage, you're about to go on and do the first gig you've done in a long time. It's quite a big room with Sebastian Bach and YMT, whoever's there. And you're putting on like eyeliner and mascara mm. and, you know, and lip gloss or whatever. Did, was there any point you looked in the mirror and thought, what the fucking hell are we doing? Yeah, there's something really strange about this because I, we, none of us, as far as I know, had gone full glam makeup for that whole period As I say, there must be between where the band finally split up mm. and or basically went on hiatus. Let me start again there. Let's go back to the wall. Yep. Okay. <coughs> there? Still running? Yeah, still running. Okay. Okay. What, was, what was interesting about getting ready for the Newcastle gig was obviously there was a lot of nerves because we didn't know if people were going to be disappointed with how we look, the fact that we were now 10 years older. Would people still be into the music, or would they think, oh, we were expecting this to be much more engaging, more fun? We certainly were worried that we wouldn't be as active and fit on stage as we had been before, because we used to be quite, you know, vibrant and quite um, yeah. athletic. But also putting on the makeup beforehand, you know, you feel vaguely ridiculous. What am I doing? Is it making a silk purse out of a pig's ear, you know? But um, it was all part and part of it, always. And this was part of the ritual of preparing for the gig, was putting the makeup on. Mm. And um, I, think, I think the audience would have been disappointed had we not done it. And that's what people expected from Tiger Tiger, was guys in makeup. Yeah. But it certainly made that period before we went on stage much more of a kind of um, a preparation for us psychologically to do it. But was there any point to say, I don't know, say, say you looked across at Jay and went, what are we doing? Yeah. And, and in fact, even when we were walking through the, you know, through the main arena to get to the, where we were playing, I was looking around just thinking, how did this happen? You know, mm. this, is, this, this was what we were doing all those years ago. And then there's this big gap, and then all of a sudden we're back here doing it again. And why are we doing it again? Yeah. And actually, after the gig, I realised the reason we were doing it again is because it's great fun. Mm. And oh. to get a positive reaction from an audience who know your material, like your material, seem to like you as people, mm. why wouldn't you do that, you know? Um, plus the, the whole backstage element of it, which is dealing with the personalities within the band, that was all going great and continues to be so. I mean, we have disagreements and things, but I think we're a lucky bunch of people in that there aren't any long-running feuds or anything. Yeah. As people, the, the personalities have always been quite complementary. Um, we don't have so much now, such a worry about record companies and management and the kind of stuff that would go wrong or, you know, your records wouldn't be in shops and you get really annoyed and hung up about it or another band would chart higher than you and you get annoyed about it. Now, I don't think any of that enters our minds. We try, in fact, not to even think about it in those competitive terms. We're just enjoying doing it. I think once it gets to the point where you're looking at studying sales figures and making sure that you haven't been ripped off by you know, whoever's accounting to you, that's when it all becomes, you're basically then bringing a whole world of shit into your life. Yeah. And that's why bands split up and why bands are unhappy. And but you you know, know. You're not going to top of the chart, so you say it's fine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> clearly not. Um, so, so, so Newcastle was, I, I think, you know, all the kinds of was, was, was a success, wasn't it? Very much so, you know, first one back. What it did, Newcastle, yeah. it, there was enough interest from the audience and the response was good enough for us to think, this is something we want to do again. Yeah. That but was then, it. But then next, you went to Venice. Oh yeah, I don't know if it was next. Was, it, was Venice the next one? Um, Let, so let's say, say that New, Newcastle was kind of the high. Yeah. So all right, so we were so, set so up. So Venice that. was the low. Yeah. We were set up now thinking, okay, I'll start again because the camera wasn't settled in. Yeah. So, you know, we, we'd had so enough good reaction to think, great, you know, things are going our way. We're sort of a bit charmed. Um, mm -hmm. Tiger Tales is back. It's going to get a good reaction wherever it goes. We're going to pull loads of punters. 
the gigs we've done have gone really well. Um, so we set off for Venice Rock Festival. We didn't know there was a rock festival in Venice. We didn't know what to expect. I was about to say. <laughs> um, so I was excited. You know, we all set off for our first sort of international adventure since we've been back. And this, this was going to be the biggest gig we'd ever, ever done. Mm. Bigger than anything we'd done way back when Tiger Tales was a b real proposition. Yeah. Um, 20 or 40,000 capacity venue. Big, big festival site. A bit like Donington, really, but in Venice, obviously. Um, and, but this was a real eye-opener. And this is kind of... Um, when I describe to people that the low points are often as fulfilling as the high points, we turned up at this place and it was cle clearly massively oversized. <laughs> there was no way they were going to fill this place. And in fact, this 40,000 capacity um, festival ended up pulling about that night about 200 people <gasps> to see us. Um, which was, was who, who was on the bill? Who was that uh, it was just us and a bunch of local glam rock bands. But they were, these gigs were every night for two okay. weeks. But I think even the bit that, the, like, they had bands on, really big bands, you know, that mm. uh, played later in the week, they only pulled sort of a thousand. So something was clearly wrong. And don't forget, you're in Italy, so all kinds of things happen that maybe wouldn't happen in other parts of the world. Do you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you mean. But we got paid. Um, we had a, then the next day, actually, we then thought, right, while we're here, let's make the most of the culture. And we went out on a gondola. And <laughs> as the tales were being cultured, and sort of reminisced on the... the Bizarre, and uh, it was, uh, bizarre is the word, because you've travelled halfway across the world, well, not halfway across the world, but you've travelled a long distance mm. to play to a smattering of people. Yeah. You've gone through all this fuss of flights and, you know, God knows what, mm. and then you just play to a bunch of people. They were great, you know, they were all well into it and everything, but it just seems really strange. And also, I suppose, after Newcastle, where you thought, yes, Tiger Tales is back. Yeah, and yeah. then it was, oh, maybe you, we're not the, quite back yet. The articles, oh, actually, maybe we're not, not quite back as yeah. we were. Um, actually, sorry about that, because obviously um, I came down to see actually here in the point where we are, mm. um, and that was an amazing gig. It was sold out. It was card. It was a kind of homecoming gig. Mm. What do you kind of remember about that night? Because that was a great night. I mean, I was quite pleased. Sorry, yeah. um, but uh, when you came and did, you know, you came back and did the point and did the Cardiff gig. Mm. Uh, what do you remember about that about playing here that night? Um, once one of the early gigs that we did that was, I think, made us realise there was a lot more to it than just four guys getting up on stage and playing music and trying to recapture something from our youth, was we actually did a gig in our hometown in The Point, which is, um, and actually, nowadays, is still holding the Bogies nights, which were, which Bogies was the nightclub where we got together and used to go every Friday, Saturday Absolutely nights. Right, yeah. This is kind of where we were born, basically. That building has consequently been knocked down, but its new home is in The Point in Cardiff. And a lot of the guys who we used to see week in, week out um, turned up for the show at, at that point. And it was really quite emotional. Lots of people in the crowd who we knew, we hadn't seen for years and years. The gig itself went great. We played pretty well. And you know, um, every, well, you could just see looking around you, all the guys were really enjoying it. And it's probably what it was one of the high points so far of um, what we've done. Because not all of the gigs have been, um, have been as good as others. Put it that way, they, they, mm -hmm. they're variable. Some of them we play better than others. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. The spark isn't there. And it's, it's important that it does stay there this time around because there's really nothing else in, in it for us. Yeah. If it stops being fun, we'll just stop doing it. Mm. So it's important that we do continue to enjoy playing together and being together. Mm. Um, but the Point show, which is our first show back in Cardiff since we got back together, was really a really special evening. That was good. Yeah, it was, it was a great night. Mm. Let's talk about some of the other festivals, well, some of the other festivals we did when you go back together. It was, it was Lorca, was it? Sweden? Yeah, two big festivals we did um, in the summer of eight. So what was it, 2006? It yeah, it was, it was last summer, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So we did two big festivals in, uh, in Europe. We did the Sweden Rock Festival, mm -hmm. which again was about 20,000 people. Wow. That went really well. It was a good one. And um, we played in Spain, Lorca. I don't know where Lorca is in Spain exactly, but um, we went there. That was another big one. Lots yeah. of and what was strange about the, the Spanish gig was um, literally 20 minutes before we went on, there was nobody there. And this was a big, it was almost like a huge... Um, like, you know, they had these agricultural shows. They have big sheds. It's like a vast shed with nobody in it. And this huge stage. We were supporting White Snake, I think, on that thing. Uh, but just five minutes before we went on, somebody ran in the dressing room and said, have you seen how many people are out there? And we sort of poked our head around the curtain. Packed, absolutely packed. And then um, we went on stage and they all went nuts. So somehow, mm. people knew the stuff. Either they knew the stuff or um, they'd come along and they were determined to just enjoy themselves and get into it. Yeah. But then we sort of realised that now, different from before, there was a, there's just more, a more positive attitude towards rock music generally than there was. I remember playing supporting bands way back in, in the 90s and mm. the, the late 80s when we were at our height. If we were playing festivals or supporting, sometimes we'd have stuff thrown at us and people being really abusive. 
and that hasn't happened in those in the expe circumstances you'd expect it to this time. It's been there seems to have been a lot more positive vibes in the audience, which is one thing that's different now. So I was going to say because obviously, obviously at the time I remember because you know because you're the Welsh band and mm. it's like you know you know working class blah blah valleys whatever, and you were a bunch of blokes in makeup. Nice though you looked. I must be honest, very good hair. Um, was 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 it? I mean, was it culturally quite different? I mean, well, was there a point where? Um, I, I remember first my I will make up. Was there a point where you thought this is what we're going to do? This is how we're going to look, and this is how we're going to present it. Was there a very definite moment where you thought this is what we'll? Because I mean, you yeah. basically came up with the title of the band. You came up with the name. It was your band. Well, essentially, what happened was uh, when I first wanted to be in a band or what, thought I can do it. It wasn't just pioneers. So a lot of kids dream about being a rock band, and mm. I did for a long time. Um, and then actually got hold of a guitar from somewhere, and I had a mate who played the drums. And we got together and made a bit of a racket, but never thought that it would ever amount to anything. Um, and I think we saw some of our mates get, actually getting somewhere and doing gigs and things. Yeah. And we just wanted to be a band, you know, not so much doing gigs, but just a group of people so we could call ourselves a band, if you like. Um, so we put an advert up in our local record store. Uh, for I think we, what we wanted was a high image guitarist along the lines <laughs> of Girl, Def Leppard. Um, so already we were into image, we were into bands like <laughs> Def Leppard and Girl had probably the most glam images that were around then because it was just before Full Body Crew and all of that had happened. But you know, our sort of touchstones were things like David Lee Roth, you know, the way that he looked. It was very flamboyant more than anything. And our kind of whole approach to the way a band should look is you should make an effort, it should be a show. Don't just turn up looking like your old man, you know. Um, and. Uh, when we got Jay in the band, we set about emulating our, you know, the way that the bands look, bands like mm. Def Leppard, even Heavy Petting, who were around at around that time. You know, there was this distinctly sort of colourful, uh, very American look. And that's how the glam thing started. We didn't even realise that, um, that we were it, developing further, wearing more makeup as it went on and stuff. But very quickly, of course, the things like Motley Crue and stuff started to happen. And then it became like a competition. Who could look the most extreme, you know? So we all started really spiking our hair really big and lots of makeup, very feminine, very feminine clothes a lot of the time. We'd have stiletto heels and stuff. Now that probably came from just being a, a, a more of a New York thing from bands like the New York Dolls and yeah. Motley Crue trying to, be, um, trying to be outrageous rather than trying to look a certain way. But we kind of thought it looked stylish and it looked, had sort of, sort of glamour to it. That's why we were doing it. But it's interesting because the whole idea of it being bordering on sort of transvestitism in a way mm -hmm. never really came up. Obviously, it was in the forefront of the mind of all these deaf metalers who were rounding Cardiff who would try and you know, throw a punch at you for looking like that. I was going like to say, you didn't get any hassle for it. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, around that time, there was a lot of conflict between the diff people who were into different types of metal and then to people who were, weren't into rock music at all would accost you in the street. Um, so clearly, on their minds, well, what, they were confused by why we were going to do this, and we never examined it. Strangely, never even thought about it. Why are these people so angry about it? Well, they were affronted, yeah, and they, you know, why are these guys dressing like women? What's it all about? Are they doing it to take the piss out of me? Mm. What is it? It was really strange, but what was good about it is all the girls who were in that scene loved it. That's what they wanted, was they wanted their men to look like that, you know, big hair, spiky hair, makeup. So it was a really, I mean, if you stopped and, and really analysed it, God knows what you'd actually find out the whole sort of psychological root of it all is. Mm. But I, I would say there's a ritualistic element to it. When you're getting ready to go on stage, there is something to be said for, you know, adorning yourself, or you become a different character, you're putting on a, your st sort of stage outfit. Yeah. Even though I hope that the way we behave on stage is just us, but a bit larger than life maybe. It still is, you know, it's definitely a step up or a, a step away well, from being your, every, your normal everyday that self. That was a kiss thing, one of them said when they took the makeup off, they didn't enjoy it so much because they used to enjoy putting the makeup on before they went on stage yeah. because it was very much a part of yeah. who they were and what they did. Did you ever feel, because there was a point obviously when I was, when I was working in the magazines and stuff, so of late 80s, early 90s, you were kind of almost like the zeitgeist. Did you ever feel you were at the, at the, at the, you know, the spearhead of anything? Did you feel like there was a thing you were involved in at the front of? I think we realised quite early on that um, we were the only band really that was prepared to, to go the extra mile and be as, not as professional, because we were never the most professional band in the world, but when we did shows, it looked like a big band. Mm. It wasn't just kind of in a pub, scruffy, you mm. know, things breaking down. We did really strive, probably in the beginning, I think it probably was like that, it was that sort of amateurish shambling sort of thing. But we very quickly addressed that and tried to get things to sound good, which is where we got samplers in to help us to have big backing vocals live and stuff. We learned to play as well as we could, you know, we, we devised elements of the stage. Like we used to have really great backdrops and things like that. Yeah. Um, all of that was, I think, noted by the press and people, and they, we were the only real contenders as a British glam rock band, I think. And I was adopted as Kerrang! magazine sort of model for their t-shirt, which made me 
a mini celebrity mm. uh, in British rock terms. Mm. There was when Kim joined the band, there was a lot of fuss about Tiger Tales as a new guitar, a new. Uh, when Kim joined the band, there was a lot of talk in the press about Tiger Tales as a new singer. Mm. That kind of made us seem like a bigger deal, like it was news that we'd got a new singer, mm. you know. So Kim was then there. And then we started doing endorsements for guitars and stuff. And Jay was very involved with that. Ace as well, when yeah. he was in the band, it's symbol endorsements. So people kind of knew who we were. We were sort of probably more famous than our record sales justified you until the Berserk album. Famous, you were very much yeah. part of... I no, mean, I mean, people yeah. knew who we yeah. were. Oh, very much so, yeah. So we were very much in people's minds. If you mentioned Tiger Tales, so anybody who was involved in rock music mm. in the late 80s, early 90s, they knew who we were. Mm. And then when we released the Berserk album, it sort of vindicated everything because we suddenly started selling records and mm. being having our videos shown on MTV. So um, there was real... But of course, with the success comes all the, the trouble, you know, all the... You think you're being ripped off. Um, things that aren't going the way you want them to. Maybe there are personal issues within the band that don't get resolved. Mm. So unfortunately, the success that comes with working hard in a band also brings a lot of other shit which isn't very welcome. Let's, let's, talk, about, um, let's talk about Berserk a bit as well, because I, I, I came up to Milton Keynes to see you when you were mm. recording with, was it Chris Tangarides? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then of course, the, you know, that album charted higher than Metallica that week. Yeah. Uh, well done. Good but work. what was really interesting, we, we always wanted to sign to Music for Nations. It's really strange because Music for Nations had all of the bands that we loved and by the time we got signed to them, I think they'd even just signed Poison, which was another band that was one of our favourites, because right. they were kind of doing exactly mm. what we were doing. Yeah. They were maybe less of a metal band than us, but you know they were in the same genre, clearly. Yeah. Um, and Metallica, who we were all into. We were even into Stripo, which was a Christian metal band who were really Can big Can I just say, time. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to use this at all, but there is an image of you at the front of a Stripo gig, I think, catching a Bible in one of oh, the videos. Oh, probably. Uh, no, no, it is. Don't, don't probably. No, uh, probably. I probably used to love Stripo. Catching a Bible at a Stripo gig. Yeah. Can we keep that in, please? That's right, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Music for Nation had lots of bands that we really liked and we also always had this idea that they were the best independent label there was and when our album Berserk came out it actually outsold everything that they'd released so far wow. so it outsold Metallica's um, Master of Puppets mm. Look What the Cat Dragged In Rod Poison so we actually were you know doing really well at that time um, so there was a period of about a year where I think we were sort of thinking we're off now we're going to keep moving ahead but the difficulty was that the record label had lost its uh, distribution in America um, we'd meanwhile been waiting for that to be sorted out for months, so it kind of put a big, st that is staggered things, and the momentum was lost really. And I think that kind of has been a trademark of us throughout our careers really, is things stopping and big gaps and then things starting up and you've lost momentum. Mm. Certainly happened later on with the whole Wasburn situation in America. So, yeah, so let's talk about it. So Berserk, you obviously had, you, had, you had a great year, you had a chart album, you were doing, you were like selling up your store in places, mm. I mean, you were doing really big gigs. When, when do you think the rock sort of set in then, uh, within that? Was it, was it in sort of personal-wise, or was it just you just realised the business wasn't working and that took it down towards the back? Lots of things. I think definitely by the stage where, where we were touring off the back of the Berserk album, we were doing better than ever. There were the personal problems that existed, I think, were um, no more than any band would have, you know, just being in close proximity to each other. Mm. Um, there were certainly some of those were more serious than others, and our drummer... Uh, had to leave because there were, there, were, there were lots and lots of very complicated reasons about that. Um, but all of us, you know, there were stresses on all of us then, but we still kept going because it was, you know, it's part and parcel of being in the band and trying to make it work. Mm. But the, 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 the reason that I think things went wrong was nothing to do with any of that. What happened is we got picked up by a very big organization from Japan mm. um, who sat up in America. Um, we were their first signing. We were going to be released... Um, with a, a long-running reality TV show that was going to run with it. We were all going to wear microphones and have cameras on us all the time. This is like 92, yeah. so way before reality television even existed. And you were in New York then, yes? This yeah. is when we were based in New yeah. York, being looked after by this, this company. So they were like, you know, there's no hurry, let's take our time do this right. They even did focus groups. They got kids in from all over the country to listen to the album, judge the tracks out of 10, mm. to work out the running order, stuff like that. Um, we'd shot the photographs in a sort of clockwork orange image. We did those out on Broadway. So it was all ready to go, and there was a lot of finance that were behind us. So, and it, at this stage, because as I mentioned, um, because uh, Nirvana had come along and Spinal Tap and Glam had been sort of killed, we'd modified kind of what we were doing, and it would have really meant that creating a new audience. But we were confident that this company that was behind us were going to be able to do that. However, um, having lived on and off in New York for about a year and a half and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed, we came back one summer to do a bit more rehearsal, um, and we had a phone call from Japan saying that this company had decided to completely withdraw from, from America. And um, 
just to stay put and wait for further developments. So mm. we were totally in limbo at this point. And for months, we weren't able to do anything at all. They wouldn't let us release the records ourselves. We weren't allowed to do anything under the name Tiger Tales because they still had plans for, you know. But in the end, we just said, well, we need to make a living here. We hadn't released a record for, you know, two years by this time, three years maybe. Um, and I think we did go out under the name Was Bones. You played, yeah, you played some shows, just, didn't you? Yeah, just to be able to keep, you know, keep our hands in, really. Mm. Um, and, you know, with not that great a deal of success, actually, probably only a couple hundred people turning up, and that's in Britain, and we'd just done a tour for Berserk, remember, the last mm. tour we'd done, which would be thousands of people yeah. turning up. So that wasn't so good, and I think we slowly realised that we could probably um, do better as Tiger Tales and not pretend to be something that we yeah. weren't, which was this more sort of grungy, mm. hard edge thing. And I think at that point, um, Jay just, you know, he thought... How old were you then? Oh, this is 94, so it would have been about... 30, I would have been like 29, 30, I suppose. Did you at any point actually think this is a mugs game? This is yeah. a, an odd way of doing things and this is not who I am? Was there ever a point where you kind of had that? I thought we all thought we were sort of flogging a dead horse here for a while. And um, you know, all the signs were telling us that because the audiences were dwindling. Mm. We didn't have a record deal. Uh, we weren't making any money. Mm. But it was the only thing we knew how to do. There, was, there were no options. Jay had started to retrain himself. He got involved in IT and stuff. He had a family. Mm. Um, and um, Can you stop there for a second? Yeah. That's really important. I think this is a bit of a okay. glitch. All right. About the struggling and okay. All the dependent. How are we time wise? Then? Where are we? We're up to about 27 minutes. Right, we'll have to wrap this up then, so I'll try and be quick. We're going to keep going. Uh, so. Uh, go. All right, so um, after all of the situation with the American record company kind of dissolving into thin air, but still saying they wanted to work with us and um, the whole tight. Every time they said, hang on, wait a bit, we'd be, have less inclination to do so because we had no money coming in and mm. we had nothing to do with ourselves day in, day out. So we did tour uh, under the name Was Bones with not that great a deal of success, actually. I mean, people came, but it was out of curiosity. And we slowly realised, I think, that we'd probably be better off going out as Tiger Tails. There, still, there was still a, a decent amount of interest. But by this point, I think Jay had realised that we were flogging a dead horse, you know, and all of us kind of knew it. But um, he was the first one really to say, you know, I've, I've got another, there's another route I can go, which mm. is like, you know, his family, so family, I have a family. Yeah, yeah. Um, he trained as a, I think in IT, computer mm. technology and stuff. So we had a long, long talk about this, but that was the first step really in things, finally, the unthinkable mm. happening, us kind of, kind of going our separate ways. We got another guitar player in um, and did a tour as Tiger Tales again. And we did a video. But how, how can I ask, sorry, but can I ask, how was it though then being on stage, say, without, without Jay, you know? Well, to be... Did you not think at that point this really is now just falling apart around us? Yeah, we picked that up to itself container us. So essentially when Jay left the band to do his own thing, we got back together as Tiger Tales with a new guitar player. Now this was never going to be the same as it was before, but it was certainly a step up from going out as Wasbones and trying to be something different. So. Um, it was okay, you know, things were doing all right, we're selling merchandise, people were coming to see us, um, it, was, it was doing okay, but it didn't feel like... Was it, yeah, was it enough? It didn't feel like um, t Tiger Tales 100%, you know, it felt like some, a different Tiger Tales version 2, I suppose. Mm. Um, and Cy was a great guitar player. We went on to re-record all of the, the American album that we'd spent so long doing. We recorded it very cheaply and released it over here on a small label. Yeah. Um, didn't really sell many copies. And by this time, because again, money wasn't cut, there wasn't enough really to, to sustain us at all. Mm. Um, I think we all started thinking, we've either got to find a totally new slant on this musically and everything, yeah. or we've all got to think about what we was, do for was, was there a point, I mean, was there like a, 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 a better word, but was there an epiphany where you were, say, I don't know, backstage, or you were somewhere and you went, this just isn't what I want, this isn't where I want to be? No, I don't, I don't think it happened like that. I don't think any of us thought, right, that's it, we're going to stop now. I think what happened, unfortunately, was it very, very slowly just withered away. Mm. Kim and I were still writing songs in 94, 95, mm. still writing lots of stuff together, um, and we just saw less and less of each other. So by sort of the end of the 90s, I'd had to go and get a job. Um, I don't know, I think Kim did the same. I ended up working in telly. Mm. Um, and found a new avenue. I never knew that I was going to have a sort of second career doing anything else. Mm. But I ended up doing video editing, which was something that really suited me. And I found that equally satisfying. And ev eventually, having sort of trained myself for about a year to do that, found that it paid, you know, there was regular money in it. Um, and it completely replaced Tiger Tales in my life. There were occasions where I'd be working with bands like the Stereophonics or something, 
and they'd recognize me. Who was Pepsi from Tiger Tales? What are you doing here? You know? mm. But it didn't, I didn't mind. I thought, well, I've done that. You know, I've been in a band. We've had a, a certain yeah. amount of success. I've enjoyed it. But um, now I'm doing something different. And that continued all the way through till... Yeah, yeah let's, let's, talk, let's, talk, let's talk about that. So you were the last one to kind of rejoin, weren't you, basically? Yeah, what happened you is... You were the um, most reluctant, I think. Towards the end of, I think, uh, the, the first title, 2004 to 2005, I think it probably was, I got a few phone calls from Jay and Kim saying, would I be interested in um, getting back together, getting the band back together? And I was sort of, well, no, I'm kind of I'm doing something else now. But they said, okay, well, what about re-releasing or releasing the, the American version of the Wasbones album, which had never been out, as we understood. So I said, well, well, yeah, fine, that's fine. But I, one thing led to another. Instead of re-releasing the album, we did some gigs and photos and started writing again. Mm. So it, that, again, it, just as slowly as the sort of the, the decline had happened, the, the sort of rebirth of it happened very slowly as well. Mm. And um, it didn't suddenly happen right, we're not together, we are together. It was just generally over, a co over the course of a couple of years we thought about releasing records yes we'll do that we did a couple of photos in our re rehearsal room mm. and then did a gig in newcastle yeah and um it seemed to work so we thought why not let's carry on okay and um, i think if the audience or the press had reacted you know with scorn or being really real cynical about what we were doing we probably wouldn't have carried on but it was you know it was we were sort of welcome cynical about it well i wasn't cynical because i was just thinking this is fun i'll have a go as long as it's fun i'll do it yeah but if we had, you know, if we people had people shouting abuse at us and stuff, perhaps we would have thought, yeah, this is a bit silly. But it doesn't feel silly. It just feels like it's, you know, it's something that we've always enjoyed and we still do. It's absolutely working. When, um, and we obviously have to touch on this, but when did you first start to feel ill then? I think I, I was talking to Mikey and he said I think it was in Sweden, was it? Yeah, you started oh, yeah. To feel this will have to be the last thing we do because I don't think we've got much time. I'll try and oh. cover this all together. I started, um, I went, we went out to, uh, to do some European festivals. This is... Um, 19, uh, sorry, 2006, Six, I think. Yeah. Um, and after coming back from the second of them, which was in Spain, in Lorca, I had a, I had a bad stomach um, and was still working, actually, for, uh, directing commercials, which I'm, is what I've been doing for years. Um, but finding it harder and harder and, and having a really bad stomach and eventually went to the doctor and they said, as they do, it's, you know, it's probably indigestion or something, and put me on um, Gaviscon. Um, that went on for a long time, still lots and lots of pain, really bad pain. Mm. Um, and also my diet hadn't been very good for years because I was always struggling with, when I was in the band I was alright actually, I wasn't too, but I'd put on lots of weight mm. and I'm desperately trying to lose it so I could do gigs with Tiger Tails, you know, since coming back, but not eating properly or anything. So I put it down to that irregular lifestyle and, um, you know, not eating properly. Um, but it got really bad and I had to go, I had a consultation with a private doctor who said um, they thought it was um, irritable bowel syndrome, which is quite a common complaint, but it's painful. He gave me some treatment for that, which was supposed to work in a month. It didn't work. I went to see a, um, a dietitian um, who told me that I had something called candida, which is a yeast over. I think the first inkling I had that there was something wrong was in the summer of 2006. We'd just done two big shows in Europe, in Sweden and in Spain. And I came back from the second of those, and obviously we'd been drinking and eating badly and everything else and staying up late. And I had what? what seemed like a familiar sort of hangover, stomach pain, um, but it didn't go away. And I, I, when we got back from those gigs, we didn't have any gigs for a while, so I was busy working, directing commercials, which is what I do full time. But it was becoming quite difficult for me to do that, to be out on, a sh on location. And, you know, it sometimes is quite stressful, sometimes there's quite a lot of things to be taken care of at once. And I was finding myself sort of less able to do that. Um, I had to go to the doctors. And normally I wouldn't have gone. I would just think, oh, it's, you know, of course I'm not very well. I don't eat properly or I drink too much. Uh, they gave me the usual thing, Gaviscon or whatever. Um, tried that for a while, it didn't work. In the end, I had to go to see a specialist, a private specialist, who told me that um, he thought I had uh, irritable bowel syndrome and there were some contracted muscles in my guts which were pulling tight like this and really putting stress on my whole digestive system, which was causing the pain. And I had a pul pulsing sort of bizarre, like as if there was something in there, like aliens type thing. You could see it pulsing. Um, anyway, he gave me tablets for that, which I took for about a month. Um, nothing happened. So I said to him, well, you know, if this isn't working, there's somebody in, in, in a works nearby, a nutritionist, who knows uh, how to look at uh, things you're allergic to, stuff like that. I thought I might have some allergies or something. So yes, I went to see her. She told me that I had an allergy to wheat and all kinds of stuff, and I was pre-diabetic. Put me on a course of um, what you'd call alternative uh, medication. 
did that for a month and in fact felt no better at all. And she said at the end of that month, well, you know, you need to, to be on it for longer than this. So I did another month of it, which took us up to Christmas. By that stage, I was really bad. I was in pain. I, I'd had to stop work by this time. I couldn't get out of bed most days. Um, really, really painful. Um, and I went to see uh, a friend of a friend who was a, a specialist and asked me to describe what I was feeling. And I remember when I was a kid, I had something called uh, acute pancreatitis, which is where your pancreas suddenly throws a wobbly and spews out bile. And very often, I think what happens is people just, their stomachs swell up and they have to relieve all this tension because it's full of hot liquid and stuff. Because it's quite a dangerous thing, it can kill you. It didn't with me, I was only in hospital for about um, a week or something. Uh, but I'd had a close call and it was to do with the pancreas. And I mentioned this to this specialist and he said, I think you need to go and see, have a scan specifically looking at your pancreas because I think there's something wrong there. And I went straight back to, well, came back to Cardiff, um, had a scan and the diagnosis was that it was cancer um, and that I need a biopsy. And the biopsy is essentially where they remove parts and they can tell you that definitely it is, you know, malignant. And so I went into hospital. Um, they took, I mean, they, they did open me right up, took quite a lot of stuff out because they had difficulty ascertaining what it was. But the outcome of this was that, you know, it was pretty advanced. It was a great big tumour. Um, they decided straight away that what I needed was pain management because pain is the worst thing, obviously. Um, and they told me that, as it was, they couldn't operate because it was too big. And, too, and it kind of wrapped around all of the, um, the blood vessels that supply your gut. And as it was explained to me, if they, if they get stuck in there, it's very easy to cut the wrong thing. And if your gut dies, you die, essentially, because, you know, that's what's keeping you alive. So they couldn't, um, couldn't operate on me. So what they said is we'd do chemotherapy, and everyone's heard horror stories about chemotherapy, but I was assured that nowadays, much fewer side effects and that. Um, then if that helped reduce it, they'd try radiotherapy, which is where they burn into your body and try to burn away the malignant tissue. Then if they could get it small enough, then they would go in and surgically try and remove it. So that was the whole course of treatment they prescribed for me. Um, unfortunately, the chemotherapy reacted. I didn't get any bad side effects necessarily. You get you, you feel a bit sick, and you know I didn't lose my hair or anything like that. But um, my blood counts were going down. You know, now your blood, you have blood cell, red blood cells and white blood cells. Um, what was happening that my immunity system was suddenly going mad when I was um, having chemotherapy, which makes you um, really vulnerable to disease. So they have to stop. Um, so I can't have the chemotherapy that would normally be prescribed for someone like me in my condition. There's one last thing that they are hoping to try, and I'm also going out to New York. In fact, I would have gone by the time this is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, all right, I'll say, um, so essentially, I've got a quite an advanced tumour. The pain is being managed okay. It's only if I forget to take a tablet, or if I take it late, or if I've had a particularly stressful day, that I do experience really bad discomfort. Otherwise, the pain is kind of being managed. Uh, generally, I've got enough energy to sort of do the odd gig with the band or do things like this. But I've got to be very careful, you know, because I've got a, a very serious illness. So it's just, it really is a case of just taking every day as it comes. And it, it's made me, you know, it's made me appreciate the good things that I've got in my life. You know, it's, a lot of stress has been lifted off me as well because I'm not working anymore. And, and I'm able to, um, I don't know, just concentrate on living in the moment and enjoying, you know, just feeling comfortable mm. but believe it or not that's what I enjoy in my life is feeling free of, of pain basically and they assure me that that will be able to be something that can be continued until till it gets very bad so I've just been one of those unlucky people there seem to be lots more people who are getting these kind of conditions and I'm just one of them um, it's difficult for the people around me who care about me of course and it's difficult for me to lead a normal life but uh, you know it does happen to lots of people so there's no reason why I should be exempt you know mm. and uh just hope that I have enough time left to sort of get this video finished for everybody to see and, you know, maybe do some more gigs with the band. This is rubbish. <laughs> um, do you want to talk a bit about some of the videos? Yeah, I'll go, it's a totally different thing then. Um, let's, so, let's, so I'll just quickly s synopsis about videos and how, what I do. And, yeah, and, and, and how much you kind of creative control you had over them yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. When, um, when we used to do videos, uh, for instance, uh, the first one we did was Living Without You. The first video we made was Living Without You. We had no control over this at all, other than our record company wanted it to be a live video. 
we didn't want it to be a live video, we wanted it to be a concept. And it, because it was called Living Without You, we had this idea we'd be in a big house with all the furniture all draped, you know, and Kim wandering around in this house. So we had this idea. What they did, in fact, was stick us in a house and then make us do a performance video. So it was um, basically neither one thing or the other. It looked all right. It was kind of at the height of our really tacky Bet Lynch type glam period. <laughs> So we didn't look great. It looked like it's four of us going mad in a shoebox with lots of, uh, <laughs> lots of hairspray. Um, so that was the first one. The second one was Love Bomb Baby, which was a huge, it looks like sort of Terminator type thing, on a budget, obviously. But that was really good fun. And by this stage, our outfits had become more sort of conceptual, a bit more Kiss-like. And we had sort of explosions and stuff. That's a really good. I still enjoy watching that. It's really funny. Um, then the next one after that was Noise Level Critical, which is a bit more grungy, still quite glam, but... Um, that was good. Look, that shows, I mean, you can see that not much money was spent on that. It does show its budget a little bit, but it's all right. Then we did um, a concert in St. David's Hall in Cardiff, which we filmed as a long format concert video. And um, they made up um, a live video for the track Heaven, which is essentially just made up of clips from, from the show. So that's OK. We then, um, after, um, after being stuffed, basically, by the company that was looking after us in America, um, we did a video for a track called Dirty Needles, which actually was, was shot by a guy called David Ryder Prangley, who's the singer in um, Rachel Stamp, who some people might have heard of. Don't know what Dave's doing now. I'm sure we'll get back in touch when he sees this. Um, and that was shot, literally. He hired a video camera, we shot it, and a mate of ours edited it. Um, that really does show its low-budget origins. Mm -hmm. Then, um, so that was the last thing we did with Jay in the band, and we did that all on our own. It got showed in a couple of places, but never made MTV or anything, because it really was really cheap. Then we did uh, a video for Belly of the Beast, which was on the re-recorded UK version of, of Wise Bones. And actually, that was all right. And this is the first time we'd actually um, really got some money together to do it. Not that it cost a lot of money, but we were given a budget to make this video. So there's like pig's heads on sticks in it, and there's all kinds of things going on. Jay, unfortunately, wasn't in that video because he left the band by that time. Cy Danaher was the guitar player. But it's all right. What, what I realized straight away after having shot it was that my... my um, Naivety as a director, I've never directed anything in my life, was just how much stuff you need for a pop video. You can't just shoot a wide shot and a couple of tighter versions. So I probably shot about half the coverage that I needed, but it looks okay, it's all right. Um, so that was um, our sort of last experience of doing videos um, back in the day, as it were, mm. before we sort of split. Now, this time around, um, we were able to, because the nature of the business that I work in, we were able to pull in lots of favors from lots of friends and did a video for Falling Down. Um, so I was able to get lots of compositing done by a mate who works with me. So you see the, the people falling off things, which is all done blue screen. A lot of people are now familiar with how that's done. You shoot someone against a flat colour, and you remove that colour from behind them, and they can be superimposed on any background. We did some real high-speed stuff, so which means that you shoot at a very high frame rate, and stuff moves very slowly. So there's shots of all of sm smashing things up, and you can see every little tiny thing breaking. So there's some really good stuff in that video. It probably looks like it costs a lot of money, but as I said, because we had lots of favours done for us. So that one was pretty good. And then, um, obviously, we'll be looking at do, doing more videos in the future. Um, but generally speaking, the, the new, I think the falling down video, I think we needed people to know what we looked like because we were coming back after all this time. So they needed to see that we hadn't just turned into sort of some 60, 70 year old guys, you know, and we could still move about a bit. And, uh, you know, kind of what to expect. It hopefully, it would generally it would make them want to come and see us live. So it was, there was some thinking. It wasn't just make, let's make a crazy video. And I think that applies to most of what we do now. We're kind of thinking logically, you know, um, even designing sleeves and things like that. How does this, this help us to sell the record or how does it help us to give the right impression to our target audience? Is it still about the look, then? I think the look's still there. It's still a part of it. I think if we just suddenly stop bothering altogether, I think people might lose a bit of interest because it's always been a big part of what we do. Um, but I don't think we'll ever get, go back to being as flamboyant as we have in the past. It just was, doesn't really sit very well. It becomes something else. If you're not a young, slim, muscular guy, it becomes something uh, a bit, bit sad. Yeah. <laughs> so we probably won't be as outrageously glam as we have been in the past for a long time yet. Anyway, that's it. Let's, let's leave it at that. Yeah, go on, yeah, go on, cool.